Hello, uh, welcome to the fourth lecture of uh, Advanced Data Structures and Algorithms. So in this lecture, uh, we'll uh, conclude on asymptotics, which we had started in the uh, last lecture. And we'll briefly see uh, how to solve recurrences. If you uh, remember, uh, in the second lecture, we had a couple of recurrence relations. In fact, recurrence one is based on uh, Karatsuba's multiplication, uh, integer multiplication, the other one based on uh, Strassen's matrix multiplication. We'll quickly see how to uh, solve or reason about such recurrences. And we'll quickly uh, see uh, way of uh, proving lower bound for sorting algorithms okay yeah so in the last uh, lecture and um, also in the tutorial we saw a lot about um, big o big omega and uh, theta notations just to conclude i mean i'll just quickly say something about little o and little omega notations so remember so big O written this way with the capital O and big omega is this is the capital omega okay so now little O is basically we'll just write with small O and small omega so just call it as little notation okay so the definition is fairly simple so we say that F is little of G okay if F is big of G but not theta of g okay similarly f is little of a little omega of g if f is omega of g but f is not theta of g so what does this mean so let's just quickly see what this means so so let's look at the first one f is o of g that is there exists C and there exists n0 such that for all n greater or equal to n0 f of n is less or equal to c of c times g of n okay now what does it mean to say that f is not theta of g that is equivalently f is not omega of g okay what is this not of omega of g what does it mean that is for all c and for all n0 so negation of this statement that is there exists n which is greater than or equal to n0 such that f of n is less than c times g of n okay so just not to confuse you i'll put this as c prime okay because it's not the same c here <coughs> what does it mean See, when you say f is theta of g, that means f is omega of g. What does it mean to say f is omega g? There exists a c, c prime and there exists an n0 such that for all n greater or equal to n0, f of n is uh, greater or equal to c, times, c prime times g of n. Now, negation of that is for every c prime, for every, so for every c prime, for every n0, there must be an n. So instead of for all, there exists, but this condition remains, which is greater than n0, where the omega condition is violated. That is, f of n greater or equal to c prime gn is violated. That is, f of n is less than gn, but for one particular. Okay. So what does this mean, mean to say? It just says that f is not lower bounded by any constant factor of g okay so what does it mean 
when I say f is not bounded by lower bounded by constant factor of g it basically means that f is strictly smaller growing function than g so this basically says that f goes up to a constant factor is a smaller growing function I mean less faster growing function than g but this ensures that it is not just up to constant factor f is strictly slower growing okay so let me let me just elaborate okay so for example we can say that n cube is little of n to the 4 this is because so clearly n cube is big o of n to the 4 by definition I mean uh, by definition of big O but n cube is not omega of n to the 4 right so similarly n square versus n square log n so n square is certainly big O of n square log n but n square is not big omega of n square log n see simple rule is the following okay so you just see i mean if it is power of n right or if this is an exponential function all you see is look at the exponents okay so the base is the same if the base is the same look at the exponent if exponent is a larger function or larger value then you know that you have little o here okay for the larger function so here again but here there is no exponent right but here is there is a log n factor which is a non-constant instead of log n if i had 10,000 then this statement is incorrect n square is not little o of 10,000 n square n square is theta of 10,000 n square okay it's the same thing here so instead of 3 here there is 3.1 so that's why i could put little o so little o notation only says strictness of the big o notation okay so big o notation but not theta means little o okay so for another example is uh, so n cube is little o of 2 to the power n 2 to the n is little o of 2 to the 2n okay more examples so I'll just leave it to you to convince yourself uh, the, with respect to the formal definition. So exactly the dual of it is little omega. Okay. That is lower bounded but not upper bounded. So n square is little omega of n to the 5. No, sorry, n to the 1.5. n cube is little omega of n square. This is the opposite of. So n to the 4 is little omega of n cube here n square log n is little omega of n square n to the 3.1 is little omega of n to the 3 and so on okay yeah so this notation i mean i just introduced so that when i i mean it could be that at some point we'll be using it all of a sudden so just that i should not get surprised but of course i'll uh, explain even then uh, so this is typically denoted uh, while analyzing algorithms say for example if you say my algorithm runs in time n square plus little of n that means n square is a significant factor so apart from n square what you have is something which is very tiny compared to the input length okay so that is yeah. so yeah, just uh, as a summary i mean in the sense that so you know that we have these notations but when to use them okay so one thing that we need to uh, remember is big o is used always to upper bound particularly if you have an algorithm right if you say your algorithm runs in big o of n log n big o of n square so that means your algorithm in the worst case will run in so much time so algorithm is upper bounded it could be that when i say big o of n square my algorithm might be running in n log n time but uh, saying big of n square is fine but it's not completely um, optimal in the sense that you better say it has order of n log n okay so similarly omega omega is typically used to lower bound a function so usually i mean we don't use it 
use this notation for algorithms right away okay so we use it for problems so when i say um, sorting or uh, say sorting requires omega n square that means any algorithm for sorting will require so much time or if i say sorting requires n log n time that means any algorithm for sorting requires uh, n log n time okay or omega n log n time up to a constant factor uh, typically we don't use it for algorithms algorithm it's it's fine to use i mean it just says that when i say algorithm requires omega n log n time means on every input algorithm should require n log n time okay whereas in, there could be best case examples where your algorithm runs in order of n time okay and theta this is when both upper and lower bounded so when i say f is theta gn f is upper bounded by g up to a constant factor as well as f is lower bounded g up to a constant factor okay or more typically i can i can write so that is there exists c1 c2 and n0 such that for all n greater or equal to n0 c1 g of n less or equal to f of n c2 g of n okay yeah so this means f is theta g of n okay so now you might ask okay uh, so theta involves both o and omega so then don't i really need two values so i i used to two constants here c1 c2 uh, so don't i need two values n0 1 and n, or n0 and n0 prime well what you can use is you can use a larger of the two as n0 that's good enough okay so the statement holds so it's i mean you can write it with the two n zeros n0 and n0 prime but this is also fine because you can take larger of the two okay one from omega and one from o so yeah uh, i hope uh, uh, it is clear now uh, so we'll uh, talk about recursive relations so that's all about uh, asymptotic notations uh, in the rest of the lecture we'll be talking about recursions briefly i mean uh, just to familiarize ourselves with we will not be really systematically developing methods to solve rec uh, recursive relations you might have seen it in your uh, discrete mathematics course uh, how to solve uh, recurrences but you might also noticed uh, i mean there are uh, fixed methods or there are neat methods only for a very small set of recurrences or recursive relations in general it's not very easy to solve recursive relations uh, for us we'll just see recursions which are usually occur in divide and conquer type of algorithms and uh, we'll have a method to solve them in most cases it's not very difficult to solve okay so let's just uh, take some of the examples so for example the integer multiplication the first divide and conquer method this was the recurrence that we got t of n is 4 times t of n by 2 plus cn so if you remember i mean i had written less than or equal to because it was an upper bound instead i'll just take equality so that our um, things are easy okay uh, obtaining solutions are easy otherwise you'll have to give again asymptotics and so on and the karatsuba version had 4 replaced by 3 so here i said i mean this solves to uh, order of n square whereas this solves to some constant factor into n to the 1.59 in fact one n to the 1.585 something like that oh, oh sorry 585 yeah okay so yeah so this is what we had stated Okay. so today we'll see more concretely why this is so okay so how to solve such recurrences or such recursions so like i said there is no universal method we'll just see 
three methods which are fairly sound enough uh, which are easy to work with but it, it works in most of the scenarios that is relevant to our course okay. so i'll use uh, these examples just to demonstrate uh, the methods okay so so that is a simple selection sort recurrence uh, if you have done selection sort the recurrence relation would look like this so t of n so sorting an array on n elements you reduce to sorting an array of n minus 1 elements but the effort put to do, do this is order of n up to a constant factor so we we'll just write it as cn so for merge sort to sort an n element array you split it into two parts okay so and then sort them independently so it's like a two times t of n by two plus so the effort to merge back to get the original array is again linear in n so i'll just write it as cn so this c is not the same as this c i mean whenever i write c where c is a constant i mean it's a local constant constant related to merge sort here constant related to selection sort or insertion sort here okay and the third recurrence there are two versions so one with the constant 4 and one with the constant 3 okay so we'll see that see one method to solve this recurrence and uh, for the rest of it we'll have a, a theorem called master's theorem which actually works like a magical solution okay so one thing that we need to remember is uh, when we write a recurrence or recursive relation okay uh, there should always be a base case yeah each of the recurrences need needs to have a base case so what do i mean so when i say base case i have to say t of some constant so for some constant b i need to have this value explicitly stated if it was the running time of your algorithm so in this case for sorting can say t of 1 is 1 so for a single element array sorting takes one time or constant time okay uh, if it is for integer multiplication for single bit or multiplying the two bits takes constant time so you always specify a base case so here i didn't really specify base case you can take so t of 1 is 1 t of 1 is 1 so t of 1 is so multiplying to one bit integers 1 so t of 1 is 1 or you can say t of 2 t of 3 or whatever or if you say that okay i have a 64 bit processor so t of 64 is some number which is given by the processor for multiplying so many uh, integers of uh, that length or adding integers of that length okay so i mean 64 bit processor might do a multiplication of 64 bit numbers in one shot right it might take it as one unit okay so we are not specific about it but we need to remember that whenever we specify recurrences there should be a base case <coughs> so yeah it's not basis it's base case okay so, okay so there is one small uh, not a really catch i mean one issue here so when i write recurrences in this form right see it may be that n is not even so n by 2 may not even be an integer okay so then how can i write this recurrence because t is defined usually for integer values right non-negative integer values it should be the input size input size cannot be a fraction right so that's something not we need not bother about okay so what i can do is i can replace n by 2 by seal of n by 2 that is nearest integer which is greater than n by 2 okay our running time and all will not change much because the input size changes by only one right so running time only usually if it is polynomial changes by a constant factor or else it might increase a bit but in most of the cases there is no issue so when there are specific examples we'll we'll discuss this okay so uh, in future lectures okay but right now we'll just assume n by 2 is an integer that's no big deal so that means n it will work only when n, n is a power of 2 but not to worry about it okay yeah so these are typical scenarios where n by 2 could be replaced by seal of n by 2 or sometimes maybe even floor of n by 2 um, yeah but uh, let's not worry about it 
I'll just see a simplest way of solving a recurrence. Okay. So what we call as unrolling. Okay. So we just consider this recurrence. We keep on unrolling it. So, so what do I mean by that? So I have p of n is p of n minus 1 plus cn. Now I'll apply recursion again on t of n minus 1. So this is, sorry, this is t of n minus 2 plus c into n minus 1 plus cn. You unravel it further, this is t of n minus 3 plus c into n minus 2 plus c into n minus 1 plus cn and so on. So proceeding this way, you will stop at the base case. So this is the expression that you get. So t of n is equal to c of n, c in times n plus c times n minus 1 plus c times, this should be n minus 2 here, I'm sorry, n minus 2 and so on. At b we stop. Okay. So in this case, you can just write this as, so there are n minus b minus 1 terms each is at most c times n okay so as an upper bound we get p of n is at most n minus b minus 1 times c n plus b okay well this need not be b whatever you put as t of b i'll just put it as t of b is equal to b okay it could be b square or b cube or whatever it does not matter okay but it's a constant number so relative to uh, n this is constant okay so b is a constant so so this now solves to n minus b minus 1 times c times 1. This is upper bounded by n. So this is c times n square plus constant. So this is big O of n square. It's at most say 2 times n square for large n of n. Okay. Uh, <coughs> yeah. So we have an upper bound. Right, so this recurrence has so t of n is big O of n square. Now, is there a lower bound again? So, let's see that. So, you can see that so at least n by 2 of these terms will have value at least c times n by 2. Okay, not just n by 2, it is c times n by 2. Okay, so yeah, so in other words. So we have Tn is at least n by 2 times c times n by 2. So this is c by c times n square by 4. Okay. That is, in other words, T of n is omega n square in our asymptotic notation. Okay. So So what we have shown is, so I hope it is clear, so if you look at these terms, at least half of them will have value at least c times n by 2, right, up to n by 2. So p of n is at least n by 2 times c times n by 2, which is c times n square by 4. So hence p of n is omega of n square, up to a constant factor it is at least n square. And here again up to a constant factor it is at most n square. So hence up to a constant factor, it is n square, upper and lower bounded. So, t of n is theta of n square. Okay. So, this is one way of solving the recurrence. So, similarly, if you now take uh, t of n is t of n minus 1 plus c times n to the 4, you can see that this solves to t of n is theta of n to the 5. Okay. So, I'll leave you to uh, work out the details, uh, write down the arguments. Uh, yeah, so one thing that you can notice is for the upper bound, the constant here was 2. For the lower bound, the constant here was c times c by 4. Okay. So, in fact, this is not 2. This will be c, 2c. This will be. Okay. Yeah, so there will be a gap in the upper and lower bounds. That means constant factor. See, ideally, we would like it to be upper bounded by 2n square, lower bounded by 2n square. So, that means there is no gap or upper bounded by c times n square, lower bounded by c times n square, which is not true, but there is a gap. 
but with respect to asymptotic notation it is fine okay so we'll just discuss the second method okay so the first method this may not work for all recurrences okay these kinds of linear recurrences right where t of n is written in terms of t of n minus 1 this works fairly nicely if you have uh, non linear so it is uh, that is t of n is uh, described in terms of t of n minus 2 or something like so t of n by 3 or n by 2 or say t of 2 n by 3 this may not work okay so yeah so typically for linear recurrences this works well okay the second method is again this is uh, again hand vv method i mean the sense that it works only for certain cases so we call it as guess and verify so here the approach is you first guess a solution and then prove it or verify it by induction what do i mean by that so i'll take one simple example okay so consider t of n is uh, t of 7 times t of n by 7 plus n <coughs> base case it's fine to choose anything i'll just choose t of 1 as 0 as a base case okay so now as we mentioned in the first line we need to guess the solution okay so let's guess the solution so let's say t of n is less than or equal to alpha n for some constant alpha is a solution or you can write t of n is whatever equal to alpha n or t of n is theta of alpha n or whatever but when, when i say alpha is a constant then i could have written theta of n instead of uh, theta of alpha n right so suppose there is such a solution now let's try to verify so what do we mean by verifying so we need to see if it satisfies all the cases so first let's see base case so base case we have just set t of 1 as 0 certainly this satisfies right t of 1 is less than or equal to uh, t of 1 is 0 and it is less than or equal to alpha n where alpha is a constant okay alpha is a constant greater than 1 i mean greater than 0 now induction step so for the induction step let's make the induction hypothesis that is suppose that t of k is less than or equal to alpha k for all k strictly less than n that is k up to n minus 1 this is true now write on the recurrence for uh, t of n so t of n is 7 times t of n by 7 plus n now apply induction here so this value n by 7 i'm assuming that n by 7 is uh, strictly less than n which is true so uh, t of n by 7 is alpha times n by 7 so this is 7 times alpha times n by 7 plus n okay now what does this uh, solves to so 7 by 7 this is 1 so alpha n plus n so this is alpha plus 1 times n. is that okay so we wanted t of n is less than or equal to alpha n but what we get is t of n is less than or equal to alpha plus n alpha plus 1 times n which is not good right which is not the same as alpha n so t of n is less than or equal to alpha plus 1 times n is not the same as saying t of n is less than or equal to alpha n now so some of you might be thinking so i said alpha is a constant all we need is asymptotic upper bound so why can't we just do this the problem is so when i say asymptotic bound right the constant has to be fixed okay so here the constant keeps on changing with respect to n okay so hence this certainly says that i cannot upper bound p of n by some constant times n so it's not big of n okay so why is that because so if you look at say for n by 7 i had alpha times n okay t of or alpha times n by 7 but when n increases by a factor of 7 this 
so alpha increases by 1 so that means alpha is not a constant right alpha cannot be a constant so our guess is incorrect so it fails I hope it is clear why it fails <coughs> so one thing is we can try to do more educated guess okay so there is no hard and fast rule okay this should be the guess this is the way of guessing and so on we will just make a bit more educated guess so how do I uh, make a guess, educate an, an educated guess so here is what I said so for a factor 7 increase in uh, n alpha increases by 1 that's what we saw here right so from n by 7 to n alpha increases by 1 n by 7 to n alpha increases by 1 so for a factor 7 increment in n there is a increase of alpha by 1 so what is it what function in, has this property if I increase n by a factor of 7 the value increases by 1 so it must certainly be a logarithm on n but with a base of 7 right multiplication by 7 okay so let's make the next guess so I'll guess with alpha is log n to the base of 7 so I'll say p of n is at most n times log of n to the base of 7 now let's see now let's apply the induction argument so I'm not writing the induction hypothesis again I hope uh, it's clear what is induction hypothesis so so t of n is 7 times t of n by 7 plus n by induction hypothesis this is n by 7 times log of n by 7 to the base of 7 okay plus n so now we will uh, expand this so 7 n by 7 this becomes n so n times log of n by 7 to the base of 7 plus 1 so now so this is log of n minus log of 7 which is 1 so it's n times log of n minus n to the base of 7 of course plus 1 so now oh sorry this is not 1 here this should be n plus n okay now uh, So this comes down to n logs log n to the base of 7 so t of n is upper bounded by n log n okay so our guess was right our more educated guess was right okay yeah so yeah yeah one more thing now you can ask me okay how to guess and so on so this is again a ad hoc or hand vv method i mean it's not a fixed method it works in many cases uh, so if you notice such change right one easy thing is you just uh, look at this function guess that your solution is alpha times that okay you can just imagine you are unwinding this alpha times okay so if the unwinding happens only constant many times then this alpha will be uh, constant otherwise alpha will be non-constant so if you see so how many times you will have to unwind this so here you'll have to unwind this n times right so hence the solution was order of n square whereas here you'll have to un unwind it so that this becomes a constant whatever the value b or 1 so this becomes 1 so that means you'll have to unwind it r times such that n by 7 to the r is 1 so that means this is ha this has to be unwinded log n to the base of 7 many times okay so that's a kind of intuition so yeah sometimes it's a bit troublesome i mean you cannot right away do it i mean it depends on this value so if it is some other say n square n cube and so on or if it is not the same value so instead of seven if i have six here or nine here and so on then the solution is not this simple okay but still you can do it with uh, guess and verify by induction so instead i'll state one theorem which serves as a kind of magical tool in all these scenarios okay so there are different ways of stating the theorem sorry uh, i'll just state one form so this uh, uh, so as i had mentioned in the pre um, couple of lectures ago i'll be using a note notebook or notes written by avrim blum so i'm taking a version from his notes okay so 
so reference notes by a blum or bloom okay so i have it in the google drive folder so you should be able to access it so the solution is fairly simple okay suppose we have recurrence okay so suppose a b and k are constant suppose my recurrence looks like this t of n is a times t of n by b plus n to the k okay in our example a was 7 b was 7 k was 1 it could be arbitrary but they are constants okay so for now they are constants i mean the solution also works if they are not constant but it's easier if they are constants then this solves to so t of n is theta of n to the k if a is less than b to the k t of n is theta of n to the k times log n if a is equal to b to the k and t of n is n to the log of a to the base b if a is greater than b to the k okay so these are the three possibilities see these are the only three possibilities right you are comparing uh, we are comparing a with b to the k either a is less than b to the k or it is equal to b to the k or it is at least or strictly more than b to the k in each of these cases we have solutions so yeah so if a is greater than b to the k okay so this value so a is greater than b to the k hence log of a to the base of b will be greater than k okay so in both of these cases our solution is little omega of n to the k okay so only when a is less than b to the k our solution is order of n to the k so this number okay so this is this is a rule simple rule that you can think of okay so i'll uh, give example here okay so there are three examples so what are the values of a b and k so a b and k so a is 3 b is 2 k is 2 so what case is applicable so we were comparing a with b to the k right so b to the k is to the 2 so 3 so a is less than b to the k so this is theta of n to the k so this is theta of n to the k which is square case 1 okay so now here in the second example i hope it is clear it's as simple as that so a is 4 b is 2 k is 2 so b to the k 2 to the 2 which is 4 a is 4 so a is equal to b to the k what is the solution go back so this is theta of n k n to the k log n so the solution is theta of n square log n okay now the third one is bit tedious okay so k is a large number k is not even a constant see this works only when k is a constant okay so third one you can actually not apply so master's theorem not applicable i mean you can apply it it works but it's not a constant so it, you will not get a constant forward okay because k is not a constant but still you can apply you will get this as the bound so t of n is n to the log b a but then what is k you'll have to figure out what is k so k will be n by log n okay but for our purpose we will not apply master's theorem in this case because particularly because k is not a constant k not a constant okay so okay uh, good so this is going to be our magical tool 
okay i will not really elaborate on how to prove this is a fairly simple proof okay so you just unwind the recurrence and then write it as a geometric uh, progression uh, this basically follows by staring at the ge geometric progression and summing it up okay but for us we we'll just use it as a black box now okay okay good so for the remainder of the lecture uh, we'll have some 5 minutes or so uh, we will be uh, taking a slightly uh, first step towards algorithm design rather than algorithm design we'll talk about limitations of certain algorithms okay so we'll start with the simplest problem of sorting this is perhaps the second problem or third problem that you study when you in fact start programming right uh, on, as soon as you are introduced to array the first program or second program you write will be for sorting an array okay you would have also done it in uh, your undergrad algorithms courses you would have seen a lot of uh, sorting algorithms okay so simply put what is the sorting problem you are given an array of n integers okay let's call the array as a okay what we want is output of a in sorting order without loss of generality we can let's say non decreasing order or um, ascending order okay it could also be descending order you might have two elements uh, repeat and so on an element repeat multiply multiple times and so on okay but the model we are going to see is a comparison model okay that means we are allowed to compare any two elements in the array with unit cost irrespective of their bit size so elements could be really huge but we'll just assume comparing any two elements takes unit time okay but we cannot assume anything about the actual values i cannot say that 100 occurs or 200 occurs or 300 occurs or the elements are from range 1 to 10000 1 to uh, n or 1 to 200 uh, 2 million and so on no such assumptions okay so we can, or in other words in what we are saying is you cannot look into the values you you are allowed to take two elements and compare fine you can compare and uh, take an element and compare it with some fixed value fine good but you cannot really assume that elements from this range or you cannot assume anything about the actual values you can compare them see then you can say that okay by some comparison i can decide if it is greater than 100 or not yes that is fine you can decide if it is greater than 100 or not but you cannot assume that it is less than 100 or greater than 100 okay so the cost model is very simple all we are going to count is number of comparison it's made okay so if you look at most of the algorithms that you would have seen most of them except bucket sort uh, kind of algorithms they are all um, algorithms that are comparison based they don't really care about the values okay so let's take some examples so for example bubble sort or uh, selection sort or insertion sort any of these so you see that they run in time order of n square so number of comparisons is order of n square in the worst case but as if you take merge sort or heap sort the comparison becomes order of n log n in fact it is theta of n log n okay uh sorry this is not heap sort this should be quick sort okay so quick sort takes order n log n on average that is what you must have been taught and it takes order of n square in the worst case okay so we have a plethora of algorithms where whose running times are range between n square and n log n or n log n and n square as the upper limit so you certainly don't need more than n square now the question is do you need really need n log n if yes how do you prove okay so yeah so okay so sorry quick sort was here but it should not be no heap sort here okay so heap sort is order n log comparisons so let's post the following question so what is the minimum number of comparisons required to sort an an element array okay so certainly n comparisons are needed why is that 
you need to read the input right so read the input and compare against some value something so you, you cannot hope to do something with less than n comparisons right if it is less than a com n comparisons you can see that uh, an algorithm only looks at n minus 1 inputs so uh, uh, sorry so say not uh, n say n minus 1 comparisons still order of n okay then it will have to miss at least one input there you can place some value and fool the algorithm okay in one case it will output a sort, sorted array uh, in the second case it will not output a sorted array okay so that is fine so for merge sort or heap sort order of n comparisons are enough and you might have also heard at least n log n comparisons are required but the question is how do we show it so we'll see a simple way of proving this uh, yeah so due to the time constraints uh, i think uh, <coughs> yeah we have uh, maybe a couple of minutes because if i make it longer the uh, video size will be huge so in the next lecture we are going to uh, prove a lower bound we'll have a simple mathematical argument to show that number of comparisons has to be at least n log n up to a constant factor okay so i'll uh, stop the lecture for now uh